Yeah. All righty. So super excited to have uh, Matt Wilkins here today with us to talk about galactic polymath. And so Matt had emailed us um, uh, with interest in, in doing the SAF Fellows Program and reading this. We were all super excited and we were like, oh my God, we have to talk to him and learn more about what he's doing and his job biz tool that he's uh, uh, also developing. Um, and so Matt, we're looking forward to having a conversation with you to learn more what you do and ways that we can collaborate and engage with you. Take it away. Great. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Um, basically, what I'm going to talk about uh, is an effort to build on what I've been doing as a postdoc here for the last two and a half years at the Center for Science Outreach, which is part of uh, Vanderbilt University. Um, and they have a lot of unique partnerships with Metro Nashville schools. And so my current position as a, is as a postdoc with Vanderbilt, but I am contracted um, through Metro Public Schools, and I'm actually embedded at a middle school here um, as a resident scientist. And so it's a very open-ended kind of job, but basically my main function is as a, a translator of STEM expertise. And so I work with teachers to develop um, interdisciplinary lessons that kind of, you know, um, showcase the connections between not only concepts within uh, within subjects, but also the connections between subjects so that students can see and, and to connect those things to the real world. So you'll see kind of how Galactic Polymath is um, my effort to build a company that um, facilitates this translational function. Um, so basically, I'll just explain the project. That's just a little bit of the background um, of where it comes from. So Basically with Galactic Polymath, uh, my vision is to create an interdisciplinary education platform that helps busy teachers teach uh, rigorous but engaging material um, in, a, in a way that's pretty different from the way that things are currently offered by uh, curriculum companies. Um, and I just start out with a quote, the educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation. Um, and this was actually from the year before I was born. Uh, so this is, it seems to be, you know, relevant, as relevant now as it has been in my entire lifetime. So uh, we have some pretty intransigent problems with um, STEM education. And it's probably no surprise that, you know, to, to you two and certainly anyone watching this video, um, that, you know, the U.S. outspends most countries and yet we've been declining in science, math, and reading based on international tests. Um, so it's actually getting worse on many metrics. And I would argue that part of this is because we continue to teach subjects as separate sort of isolated fields of knowledge. And, you know, when we're actually experiencing things out in, in, the, in the world, we, you know, don't experience 43 minutes of math, 43 minutes of English, 43 minutes of science. You know, everything flows together. Um, and so we should be teaching things this way because that's how people learn. That's how people connect to knowledge and concepts, you know, through problems, through real world problems. Um, and so there's a need to actively show students how different subject areas influence their lives um, and to show how, you know, each discipline perspective is connected and, you know, connected. So this is again from a long time ago and still, you know, relatively long time ago. And, you know, nothing, things are still not being taught this way. Curriculum is still not very interdisciplinary. Um, and just as another commentary on the reason that things are, you know, getting worse or staying much the same uh, in education is that, you know, from, from a scientist's perspective, um, you know, I, I can see that there's a vast amount of current knowledge that's being produced. There are an estimated 50 million scientific papers with about, you know, one and a half to two million being published every single year. Um, and most of the time and effort in conveying this current knowledge is being conveyed to other peer experts, you know, in paywall journals that people can't access or understand if they even could access. Um, there's a fair amount of information or a fair amount of effort and money being spent on popular science articles, you know, through, uh, you know, Scientific American or, you know, the science uh, section of the New York Times, you know, to undergraduate education and to some degree informal outreach, you know, in the form of like education, museum days, you know, a lot of the kind of broader impacts uh, projects that you would find, you know, people 
doing as part of the NSF uh, grant writing or, or winning process. Um, and really, when we think about the overall impact of these, you know, well, the impact in terms, first of all, there's just not very many peer experts relative to the population, you know, the people who can actually access and understand scientific journals is diminishingly small. Um, you know, it, it's been shown that like, I don't know, over, over, well, let's say the, the majority of the population cannot understand the science section in the New York Times. Um, so, you know, again, you're reaching a small, you know, with that, with that effort of writing popular science articles, you're only reaching a small audience. Um, and whereas basically the, the place where the, you know, the K-12 um, pipeline is where we send every citizen and we, you know, try to teach them about the world and how to become a good citizen and, and function in a job and to be happy. And this is where we're not actually able to um, connect people to current knowledge and current ways of thinking. So I would argue that the current system is driving science illiteracy just because of the structural, the way that it's set up. Um, and so this is kind of my model for how I see things currently. So you have this vast STEM expertise, and then you have a small number of major publishers, which somewhat arbitrarily decide which things go into textbooks. I mean, we have um, national standards like the next generation science standards uh, and common core that are attempting to identify which are the most important. Um, things to focus on that we want everyone to understand. And yet um, the format is largely still, you know, textbooks or a very dry static text that students just, they don't see the purpose of it and they, they hate them and don't learn from them. Um, and so I would blame the science of literacy in, in the United States and more, you know, abroad um, on the inability of these major publisher translators to convey this you know, important information in a way that is relevant and available to students. So a better, so, so basically, how do we bridge this gap? So lots of scientists are increasingly focused on science communication. Clearly your organization is trying to foster that and you know, support innovative ideas. And I see that like a lot of this is still focused on informal outreach and kind of creating a new website or blog series that struggles to find an audience and is eventually just not maintained because this is outside the experience and the support structure of, you know, academics. You only have a small amount of time and, you know, your main focus is actually getting grants and writing papers. Um, and so this is actually a very difficult challenge because of the complicated structure uh, and the incentive structure and also just like the standards and how that works, um, especially in the public schools. And so I see that a better model would be you Basically, if a scientist or an organization wants to reach into the public schools where they get more return on investment in terms of, you know, the majority of all individuals, you know, the, huge, the biggest audience we have that is, you know, also held accountable for the information. Like, you, you're going to struggle to have, to con convince anybody that, you know, your field is important or that climate change is real in a three-minute conversation in a museum. So you're going to get a lot more return on investment in the, in the classroom. But how do you actually, you know, make this stuff available for students? And I would argue that you need a bi-directional conversation with STEM experts um, and convey not just the dry facts of, you know, their discoveries or their current research, but, you know, their stories, their personalities, um, you know, that are interdisciplinary, that connects directly to multiple disciplines, because science in and of itself is a multidisciplinary uh, field area. Um, and, and also give students opportunities, you know, for, for data centered experiences that prepare them for, you know, the information age, active lessons that, you know, are more creative in the lesson design that kind of engage students and, um, you know, beyond just a, pre, you know, a, a, a teacher in front of the room, um, you know, conveying from on high, you know, what the information is and, and you know, highlighting these real world connections. So this um, as I hope to convince you, and maybe you're already convinced, you know, is the way to go. Um, but it doesn't exist, because if a scientist wants to do this, they have to go out and build these relationships with teachers one person at a time, and there's just no infrastructure for this because, you know, the, the schools are set up to interact with a, a small group of major, you know, educational curriculum developers. Um, and so with the CSO, the Center for Science Outreach, and the Wondery, 
here at Vanderbilt, um, you know, exploring starting this company, Galactic Polymath. So the idea behind that name is, you know, so far out of the box, you're out of the solar system and polymath is sort of an aspirational, like, a so basically this is like a ridiculously aspirational model of education. Um, so a polymath, a person of wide ranging knowledge or, or learning, you know, and so that kind of explains the tagline, think bigger, learn everything. So just have kids strive for something bigger than themselves, you know, rather than don't just pass, just don't pass the class. Don't just get an A, but just like be curious about the world, you know, and, and, and try to achieve the impossible. So what am I talking about here? So um, as an example of a case study, we're uh, currently working on, um, this is a lesson that I have implemented a couple of times uh, in two different classrooms and uh, probably a total of 200 students. Um, so how would you normally teach teaching? How would you normally teach the connections between fractions, decimals, and percents? Um, you would do an abstract worksheet where you're just practicing converting them. But students may not internalize this because, you know, when will they use it? Um, so a different way. So I worked with a sixth grade science, uh, math teacher to develop this interdisciplinary lesson based on a real recent paper in behavioral ecology um, based on a real system, the pajama cardinal fish, which is a common aquarium traded fish that is native to the South Pacific, um, based on the work by Teresa Ruger, a woman in science. Uh, she was a PhD student uh, in Australia and, and, you know, with their hands on the data. So we got real data, real study system, uh, a real study and a real scientist and um, students actually engage with this. So it's, it's an interesting system like this, this, um, basically the hook is the narrative of the person doing the research with these cool fish. And so this is first introducing um, students, you know, in a math class to an interesting aspect of biology. So these, these fish have a sort of mating by size, um, or basically th this is the um, basis of the hypothesis that they'll be testing um, using their math skills. So the reason they have a sort of mating by size would be because they have mouth brooding. And so uh, the males will actually forego eating for three weeks um, and hold the females, you know, the fertilized eggs in their mouth to protect them. So the kids are fascinated by this. <laughs> They've never considered this idea. They're like, but wait, what if he eats one, you know, and you get all these interesting questions, right? Um, but there, it also drives them to, you know, start by um, testing a hypothesis. So which line would explain your predictions for mate choice in this species. And so we can talk about, you know, scatter plots and interpreting lines of best fit. Um, you know, even in, even though they haven't actually learned this, these concepts at this point, but they're able to, you know, you know, touch on things that they will hit in the future and reinforce things that they have already learned. Um, and it makes intuitive sense that, you know, a bigger male would want to mate with a, a larger female because, um, you know, she will have more eggs stolen in his mouth, but a larger female would not want to mate with a smaller male because um, he would not be able to hold all of her eggs. And so it's kind of limiting. And so they're, they're able to test this hypothesis by breaking up the actual data from the repository dryad and then plotting them on transparency. And then they stack them up and they can actually test this relationship. So that's day one introdu introduction to the system and then day two they connect concepts further so they build on that so what about so this is actually a, an amazingly strong relationship for a biological system um, and you know this gives us a, a good you know reason to talk about you know the numerator denominator fractions and like what if the numerator is higher what does that mean you know so basically it provides a compelling story to talk about these you know otherwise abstract math lessons so what about this male? Why is he made it with a small female? So then like they're looking at points and seeing that like this outlier actually has meaning and, and allows you to interpret something about the real world. And so, um, you know, the, like this, maybe all the other females were matched up or, or maybe there's something wrong with this male. Um, yeah, to explain this, or maybe it's just, just random. Um, so the preliminary results, these are concepts, not any kind of memorization. So these are all applied questions show that uh, compared to pretest, we have a significant increase uh, after 45 days of, um, after the, the intervention. And then this is maintained basically by the end of the year. So we have a 
75% short-term and a 43% long-term increase in understanding of these target concepts. And students um, say that they, you know, they really like this lesson. Uh, they got a better understanding of the key concepts, but they also, you know, before I thought this is math and only use it in the grocery store or something, right? <laughs> That's basically where we are. Like in 2019, we're still only talking to kids about the applications, you know, in, in a grocery store or setting or something. Um, but there are infinite other connections to science, you know, to science and engineering, uh, medical health, like all these other things, um, you know, that sort of could be the basis of interdisciplinary math lessons. Um, and knowing that I can use math for science or other jobs was helpful, right? So um, that's just kind of one example um, format for translating these kind of STEM uh, expert concepts. Um, these, you know, in, in addition, we can also just have students playing around with data. So these are shiny apps that I've developed uh, in the R programming language. So um, for example, the, the one on the left, the exploring class height and foot size data. So this is just a shiny app that I built for a, a science teacher. And she was already having them measure their foot size and their and their height and then you know testing the hypothesis that you would expect a positive relationship there with taller people having bigger feet. Um, but I thought, well, what if we gave them the power to explore different classes and stuff? And you can't tell here. I don't know if I if I if I click on this, can you um see this? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, the first lesson actually turned out to be looking at outliers. So because they've collected the data, they have more ownership of it. So like, hey kids, does this look like the positive relationship we expected? It doesn't, <laughs> but why is that? Um, so we have a bunch of feet here that are huge. So like 150 centimeters with a 30 centimeter height. So what's going on, you know? And so they're like, oh, uh, it takes them a while, but then they have to figure out, oh, somebody put them in the wrong spots. So there's nobody that's like, you know, this tall with feet that big. Um, and so they can limit that and remove those um, outliers and then begin the analysis and, you know, color by class and look at, you know, if you, if you uh, include the outliers, you can figure out which classes were doing it right. So periods four and five are pretty excited. They, they didn't mess up. Um, but this kind of data analysis is like not that hard, but there's no infrastructure for teachers to do this, like to, to set this up and, in R, take some expertise, but you could easily create a shiny app where you have this basic functionality. It's built into a, a lesson, but it's individualized, so they can download a CSV uh, and then upload it to this, right? I mean, we can relatively easily create these kind of tools, but this is currently just not being done. Um, so similarly, you know, with climate change, you know, basically there's just not a lot of opportunity for students to explore this important shift in the slope, probably the biggest application of the, the, the slope, you know, in terms of, of uh, global problems, you know, looking at even, you know, uh, an eighth grade understanding of slope looks, you know, you can look at how temperature was declining up until about the industrial revolution in the 1700s and then suddenly start shooting up. Um, I think this basically just playing around with data should not be something that you only encounter uh, in a statistics um, elective in college. I think this is something that we should be getting throughout K-12. And so this is something that I wanna help create. Um, stop, if you just wanna like move on, um, I don't know. Um, so I'm going I mean, through a few examples of yeah. uh, what I consider more creative. I was thinking actually if you also can talk a little bit about the job biz uh, tool. Yeah. That you mm -hmm. have as well, um, I think that'd be great. Um, and yeah, then we so because we have some specific questions as well. Sure. So a lot of this is, you know, kind of built on data literacy. So the nearly impossible task things, th this is basically just building in puzzles and a, a cipher that, you know, kind of draw kids into, you know, like trying to figure out what this puzzle is. So, oh, this must be year, right? So then figuring out that this is a, an alphabetic shift and then decoding it, kids are really drawn into this very difficult task. And then, you know, st start to think about like what sharks per hour might mean. Um, and then this could lead to interdisciplinary questions about biology, um, you know, and 
So, um, and this is also just, you know, ripped from the headlines. I mean, um, so this, this was from a paper that came out in February. So this could be a, a pretty scalable format that we could be doing. You know, imagine if a press release also came with educational materials. Hmm. Um, so I'll just kind of skip ahead. You know, this is kind of a digital breakout format. Um, these are just other what I consider to be creative formats um, for lessons. And the idea um, behind the job viz tool is that teachers are constantly being asked by administrators and, and just out of, you know, their own personal goals, they, they want to help connect classroom lessons to the real world. But teachers and certainly students, any of us, we're limited by our knowledge of what the ecosystem of jobs is. And um, from my experience, the, the tools that are available for showing the true diversity of jobs and what they actually mean are pretty bad. Um, so this is a, a tool that I have been developing from US Bureau of Labor and Statistics data that basically is a, um, an explorable network or, or tree of um, the thousand most common jobs aligned with information about the number of people currently employed or expected to be employed in the next 10 years, uh, whether this, you know, this career is kind of heating up, um, and also what their median yearly wages are, you know, typical education needed uh, to basically allow kids to have some basis for making the largest decision of their life, you know, what, what you're going to be. Um, which is currently limited, you know, by, you know, for me, the careers I was exposed to by my family and, you know, their friends, which is a pretty small amount of things. I feel like I just stumbled into science. Um, so that's one piece. Um, and I think, you know, for example, one of the biggest STEM, uh, the most widespread STEM lessons that you hear about is people like building a bridge out of popsicles, right? Um, but I like to pick on that lesson because I find it, it is really often not differentiated from like a, a game. Um, you know, like you, a lot of times it's not scaffolded with the engineering principles, the design principles, you know, like w I, what, w you know, material science, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, also the careers that are involved with that, like, there are so many careers involved with building anything from like structural to materials engineering, civil engineering, the actual construction crews, the, you know, the foreman, um, you know, and so like that STEM uh, activity, actually, I've never seen it where it would actually connect it to careers. And so like, it would be really cool to be able to like filter this tree to only include basically all of the careers that are involved with a particular lesson. And so this, tool could be sort of part of the framework for, you know, storing all these little pieces of information and like how they intersect with different careers and have like a kind of a more systems understanding of, uh, well, of, of everything. But um, yeah, so that's kind of my dream for that. So the whole vision is basically to create an ecosystem of content that is, you know, time-saving, current, data-centered, interdisciplinary, standards-aligned, and engaging but connected to the real world and to real experts and their stories. So that's, uh, yeah. And then the potential okay. revenue streams could be. Yeah. And it's so I'm going to stop you there. Yeah. Um, and I think we can just sort of jump back and forth. Um, Pete, I, I think you probably are itching to ask him some questions. I think you're, <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll let you start. <laughs> okay. Um, so first I think this is such a, a really neat idea. Um, I'm involved in kind of middle school outreach stuff. And one of the things we're doing right now is trying to create like more of a longitudinal um, experience for students so that um, we can just see what kind of effect does that have on science attitudes and things like that. Right. Um, one of my first questions is one of the things that really means a lot to me. And I think you kind of have started doing some of it already, but is like, how are you assessing the whether this is working um, I saw your graph obviously you have retention that's every educator's hope is that there is retention do you have right. another group to compare that to to say that this is a better way for us to go forward I know that's really difficult in terms of IRB and things like that 
but I'm yeah. just curious. <laughs> well, also, we haven't managed to publish the case study, so <laughs> we haven't got beyond that. Um, yeah. But yeah, certainly that that's always a challenge. I mean, so ba basically anything I would tell you is uh, anecdotal. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I can see that like, you know, teachers, I, you know, so I've been in, involved with two different schools here in Nashville. Um, so uh, this is my second year at my current school. And I can say that like, just from my perspective, like being, having taught these things in the classroom and just being there at school, like I, I feel a shift in the collegiality of teachers that they're like working more with other teachers. Mm -hmm. um, they're exploring connections like, you know, right now I'm working on an interdisciplinary lesson, uh, actually a unit with George Washington Carver uh, in an English class, but he's also invited in social studies, math, science, and the, the STEAM teacher to like co-plan something to like look at, he was, he was always interested in art. And so like maybe having students extract pigments and like do a SCICOM uh, like, unit that is kind of like meta so like they're actually learning about p natural pigments and how the, those can be used to paint things but also creating a science communication thing that conveys their understanding of George Washington Carver huh. um, yeah so th I don't think that would have happened before right. um, because this teacher in particular is just kind of struggle with understanding what steam means and what interdisciplinary learning is like what does it look like from a design perspective and so just having an ecosystem of this stuff available where where teachers can see it and you know see an example like just talking about it in an abstract form like teachers don't learn it in the same way that students don't learn it yeah so one thing i would suggest if you're open to it and it's something that i'm going to start doing because i didn't do it either <laughs> um is surveying the teachers right there's that, that's data that you can get that you can say even if it's just qualitative right like right. How did you feel about this? Um, what kind of improvements did you see? And those sorts of things. And, and that's just one more tool for you as you're trying to sell this to people. Um, right. That's something that you want to do that, oh, look, these teachers all said X, Y, Z. So um, just a, an idea. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's been on my to-do list. And I just, I need to. I understand that. <laughs> put it up the list. <laughs> uh, um, what was, so I'm, so one of the things you mentioned um, also was this idea of like a press release of a paper, right, with educational tools attached to it. And that was something yeah. to me that sounded really, really interesting and exciting because that that is something that you could take on without having to have a whole bunch of other people having bought in already um, to, some, to yeah. potentially. Um, can you tell me a little bit more how, about that idea? Have you... I mean, if, if people would pay for it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I guess the question is, you know, like, I don't want to add to the system. So like, I certainly, I think anything that's grant funded in the system would need to be open, open access. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there is a need for like subscription based things. Many schools have a lot of budget for that kind of thing. But the press release, like, I guess, would the university pay for it? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know because a lot of this stuff doesn't exist, it just seems like that, that piece is missing, right? So like when yeah. a new discovery happens, it's translated only for the, co the cognoscenti, the people who are already science literate. Yeah. Um, but why shouldn't it be translated for our youngest people, especially since adults already have their minds made up about most things. So <laughs> it's shown that like, if you teach the kids, they will teach their parents. And, you know, um, I think we should be making, I think we've got it upside down. Like it's not just it's, grad students aren't the ones who deserve closest proximity to the, you know, the latest and greatest. I think it needs to be everyone, that largest audience. Um, it's the democratization of, in, of information. Um, I very much support that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so uh, Pete, would you mind going back to the slide where you have the two models um, and you, you know, you had one saying this is the old model and this is the new model or the one that no one is doing or something. I forgot what slide it was. Um, I think that's a good ref re reference point to just uh, talk mm -hmm. about sort of where 
where is galactic polymath and all these tools you're developing right so yeah you so here. like yeah just if you can have them all fully just displayed yeah so um my, my thing is just thinking more about you know you said you've done this in two schools right mm -hmm. so far okay um and this is where i'm i'm there five days a week five days a week okay yeah so i was gonna ask that what's so just tell us the process so you're there you say five days a week for how long and what what is happening are you plugging a full into work day so this? yeah so basically the only consistent thing for me right now is i teach uh, a sustainability class for advanced fifth and sixth graders okay and so they're my eco team uh and so they have been it, it's highly individualized so um normally this is during personal learning time so it's sort of like a study hall and normally they would be practicing reading but these kids are advanced readers so basically I have given them a little you know some background on you know the larger scale of things like you know the UN sustainable development goals mm -hmm. uh, you know some climate change plastic pollution you know these kind of larger issues and then we are working at a local level um, on what to do about those things so um, the school did not recycle. In fact, the whole district basically doesn't recycle here. And uh, so we started, and part of it is because it's nobody's job. For some reason, it's not negotiated with the janitorial staff to take recycling. So that's part of it. Um, and then given that, there's no culture of recycling or sustainability, well, in Nashville generally, but um, in the schools. <laughs> I was going to agree with that. I was at Vanderbilt for graduate school. So I, oh, really? I completely yeah. agree with that. <laughs> it was like really disturbing, really um, difficult to recycle as opposed to easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so, so there's also, there's no receptacles. So the first thing we did was like get a bunch of boxes, paint them, distribute them to the 40 classrooms um, and then set up like basically we figured out, staging one class you know one grade level uh, at a time and, and scaled up our system for collecting separating weighing uh, and mm -hmm. and monitoring the recycling progress for the whole school mm -hmm. and so last year they they're looking at trash you know they're collecting data on trash and stuff and they diverted over 2,000 pounds uh, of material over this the school year um, so, so they, are you, yes. so let me ask you this, are, are you um, working, you said you're teaching there, so I, you like teach a course in the school and that's how you were able to do like your studies or are you collaborate with a teacher at the school and, and you, you like show up and you do these sessions in their classroom? I just want to get a sense of how does this yeah, play right. out. Yeah. So the, the eco team thing is my consistent gig, uh -huh. so I do that every morning. Um, and then the rest of the day, I'm there from uh, 7.45 to 3 to three o'clock. Um, and the rest of the time, teacher wants to do something. Like I mentioned this George Washington Carver uh, lesson. He just emailed me. It's like, can we meet, plan this? Um, I'm also doing an English uh, interdisciplinary unit on um, neurobiology, which I, I saw that you just published on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, that was very interesting. Um, I, I totally agree that like getting undergrads in there to like help co-develop that would be really powerful. I yeah. see. I but see. for this, it's just me and the and the two teachers. So there's like fifth and sixth grade. There's actually two two subject teachers for every class. So I'm co-teaching with both of them mm -hmm. to develop this unit. Um, I see. And and yeah, so it's it's sometimes I teach. Sometimes I just develop the materials and give it to them. Um, yeah, and, first, and sometimes it's first one, then the other. Like, basically, we co-developed it last year, um, and then this year, they're like, oh, by the way, I'm going to teach this. And like, I was like, do you need me for anything? They're like, nope. So mm. that's pretty nice, actually, <laughs> <laughs> building capacity. Because what, what I'm seeing, like, for this better model that you have, right, I, I like this approach to uh, using data, like real data for students, yeah. right, where right. they're actually managing and messing around with it. And they realize, actually, it's pretty dirty, Right. Yeah. And real, it's really messy, right? The things that are outliers and what do you do with them? Right. Yeah. And just the nature of understanding our right. universe. Like right. You right. plot some stuff, you test the hypothesis. Like that's right. one right. of the main yeah. ways we do that. <laughs> I totally agree. So from your end with Galactic Polymath, um, it's a team of you, right? Is that correct? 
So, yeah, I, I've managed to recruit some pro bono help. Okay. Um, yeah, so okay. I have a web devo, a volunteer web devo team of three now okay. who are helping develop some stuff um, like the, the job is tool and then a database tool that okay. will connect with that. So like basically when you navigate to the edge of the trees, uh -huh. you will find a series of profiles. So who are the people that are, you know, civic civil engineers? Like what, what do they do? Okay. But more than that, like not just what is that job description, but like, who are they? Where do they come from? What languages do they speak? What's their story? Like, what do they do for fun? And I think that's kind of what's missing in a lot of these kind of STEM databases. Right, um, it's right. like, you can't identify with like an abstract. I mean, most people are like, not, I want to be an ornithologist, you know, maybe some kid, I know one kid in my school that does, says that already, but, <laughs> but most of them don't have that idea. Right. So it's like, they need to connect with the job through the person. Yeah. The real person. I, I would recommend you also do check out labexchange.org. Um, it's I don't know about that. Tool, um, that we were collaborating with here at Harvard. Um, and just thinking about what you were saying, this hands-on learning, and it's biocentric, it's more biology focused. Um, I think Pete, you know about this, I, I may have mentioned yeah. it to you. And so they're doing a little bit, just getting the kids' hands sort of in the data, in the action, right? Um, cool. And I really, really, I think, just, just check it out, it's quite fascinating I will. As, a, as a platform. So from, uh, from your end, I see you're developing these, these modules online, right? I really love the data stuff that we can do on there, right? So I, I'm guessing you're thinking as a way of, because you can also teach teachers how to use these things too right. in their yeah. lessons. That way it's a plug-in. And so part of it is educative. Jazz. It needs to be supported on the back, on the back right. end. So a non-specialist right. can teach it. Um, right. That's so, really, really useful. Right? And then the data, I guess the data that, that is there that's pulling from that information, you, you are hosting it somewhere, I'm assuming, right? Your, your server. Um, the data? Yeah. And those tools that you showed. Currently, everything's on Google Drive. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like that. And I, and I, and I think I want to keep it that way just because, I mean, some things about Google Slides is kind of limiting. You can't embed sounds, for example. Yeah. You can only embed YouTube videos. You can't do other uh, video platforms. Right. But it's, you know, it's free. And you can, if I give you my slides, you can make a copy and then change them however you want. So remix, I think that's the big thing is like a lot of educational materials are still just kind of like, you know, we figured out how, how it should be incorporated. And then you have to go with that. You have to figure out what we meant to do, mm -hmm. but like current, I mean, current teaching practices is like teachers are educational DJs. They're like remixing stuff all the time. Like I'm using this reading from here, but the activity pair with that was garbage. So I'm going to create my own. So, you know, it, we need to be able to like be flexible that way. Right. Right. Um, and so, so how do you envision, how can we help you here? Because I think I've been thinking about this. You're, sounds like you're, you're trying to decide how to go forward, right? You have the business. Model. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of ideas. You have uh, the side of it. And then there's the other side, a nonprofit model too, right? Where right. the grants, um, do you have any grants at all actually? And how is Vanderbilt? Helping I got you? a micro, I got a micro grant um, through the, the Wondery, okay. but no, I don't have anything, you know, large. I, I think I'm going to apply for SBIR. Okay. Um, and so I'll eat, I'll eat, I probably both, like I'll probably apply for an SBIR and then maybe look at like, um, try to apply for the NSF i -Corps program. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. And so from your end, you, do you want to like do this full time and like what, yeah. what's your vision here? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to, I want to start an educational studio. Like, I don't think that's a common concept, Yeah. but like, I just want to, I just want to get a group of people like, you know, uh, web designers, you know, creatives, like graphic artists, you know, video producers, like uh, curriculum specialists, like mm -hmm. even, you know, game designers, like puzzle makers and stuff, and just be able to work with them to translate this stuff, like translating it so that it's understandable is not enough. And that's basically what we're doing. It needs to have a story. It needs to have a hook and it needs to be rigorous and it needs to be tied to real data. Um, and, and that it requires a number of different areas of expertise. Uh, you know, so I, yeah, I want to assemble a team like that and be able to just contract it out. Like it, it's, I think it's a specialized skill set, and, um, you know, having scientists do broader impacts 
um, you know, I, I think we're doing good, but it's just, it's just at too small of a scale currently. And then part of that is infrastructural. So. Yeah. Oh, Pete, do you have any? Uh, so I, I mean, I think, I think what you're saying is I, I'm 100% on board with, <laughs> with everything that Great. you said. Um, I, I mean, for me, and I've bitten off a lot less than you have, I'll say that for sure. Um, but for me, it's still the, the question is, and it, for, how do we get this to more people, right? How do we get more buy-in? How do we get this? And it almost seems like you're thinking, let's develop a, a new curriculum that we can sell, right, to, to some of these school systems and, and things like that. Um, is that, am I correct in that? I mean, first? partially, like, I, I see like a hybrid or, you know, kind of a freemium model. Um, where, you know, especially anything contracted through broader impacts would be open access. Okay. Um, so if I, you know, if people write me into their grant and they say, we're going to give them $10,000 to, you know, create this amazing unit, you know, including multimedia, these data analysis tools, all this stuff. And, and then, you know, keep it on the server for perpetuity mm -hmm. and make sure that it gets out and monitor that it gets out to thousands of students and then report back statistics. So that you can say when your next grant, like, look, I actually achieved broader impacts. Like, look, 10,000 kids took this course and here are quotes from the teachers and the students and like how it improved learning and like made kids more curious and more engaged in their classrooms. Okay. So you're that's, thinking of plugging into kind of that broader impacts group, that group of people who are part of it. Yeah. That's like a long, <laughs> that's a long-term cycle, right? Like, yeah. and, and you're never granted there's no security in that. Like I could invest in 20 grants and maybe get, you know, maybe I don't, maybe it depends on who they are. Right. So <laughs> how successful they are at grant writing, but like, yeah, that's kind of an uncertain uh, uh, revenue stream. So I think, you know, also having subscriptions mm -hmm. for in-house developed content mm -hmm. um, is another revenue stream. So you, you have no website right now, right? Like actual... We're working on it. Okay. Um, there's a landing page right now, but. Okay. Okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. Like, how do you? Uh, I'm curious to see how you all bring it together, right? And and I think there are many models um, you can totally go for. So, so so how can we how can we help you, uh, Matt? I mean, um, <laughs> so I think. One, end, one... end, let me just say this. From our end, you know, so we're building, and this is all. We all volunteers, you know. Right. Like you, we have a ton of stuff we're doing and um, this yeah. is you know, kind of our side thing too, right, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and so um, I, I don't know, you know, you mentioned that the job this thing, you wanted to get some funding for that and develop that out, right? That's that's one way. Um, I think, you know, from our end, you know, we are trying to bring people to get like what you said, right? You want to create a studio. We are kind of create a similar place, but just thinking more broader, like science and society, these links, mm -hmm. right? And bringing people, diverse people that are doing any type of wor work that is, in, that is in trying to connect the two uh, spheres in a right. way. And I see this kind of fitting in there, right? Uh, more on the educational side for sure, but still uh, relevant. And, and so I'm the way I've sort of structured this is to create a place where people can just come and build these things. Um, and, and whether they want to write grants, right? So we have the 501 and they can do that side. Uh, we've had the fellows program because people want to come in and do a very short like timeline and they want to work on the thing, get some little bit of funding to do a podcast, to do, I don't know, um, like, like Pete, for example, you know, it was yeah. doing a project. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, and it was like super low cost. Um, but I, you know, from anyway, from from you you describing what you're trying to do, I mean, it's quite a quite quite a, quite expensive actually. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. How, how can we? How can we? Our little low beings. How can we help you? <laughs> um, I mean, certainly, you know, promotion and you know, I mean, word of mouth is going to mean a lot. You know, okay. for people who are, and and I think people will look to you. You know, you're an existing organization um, that will have a growing impact in terms of like just putting putting people in contact with me and saying like that I exist and you know to like for uh, for either you or other nonprofits who might want an educational translation like service to right. you know it's like well we want this i mean basically if you're a nonprofit and you and and your focus is something that you think everybody should know 
Um, I don't think that belongs in outreach. I think that or informal outreach, right? right. That, that right. belongs. You need some rigorous curriculum right. that has like some kind of hook that's going to the best thing that I have heard. Okay. You're talking about impact is when parents tell me you're the reason my kid was talking to us for 30 minutes about corn or, <laughs> or how King Tut died. And that's because I created these experiences that they took home with them. And you know, that is just like the best reward for me is like when they take the learning beyond the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other model, uh, uh, Matt, I'm thinking for each of those modules created, you can imagine writing a, like a micro grants, right. Uh, for these things for specifically, that's, that's another way. But right now when you write grants, are you able to write them? Like how does it work through Vanderbilt? Like how is it structured? Are you able to write as a PI or how? No, because you... I'm a postdoc. Right. right. Yes. That, that's what I was going to get at. <laughs> and, yeah. and so how does that work? Who, who sits there? Who, who do you write? Director. Vanderbilt? Director. Yeah, the director of the Center for Science Outreach is Jennifer Ufnar. Okay. And you've, you pretty much have a lot of freedom to do that, I'm guessing. Like you, um, to, to write grants? To write, to write these grants, right? Because usually yeah. universities can, can place sometimes, you know, be kind of. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I just don't know. Uh, I'm at a place like, you know, SBIR is for small businesses, right? So right. I would need to incorporate to apply for one of those. Right. Uh, I'm a postdoc, so I can't apply for main NSF and NIH grants. So I'm in a place where it's actually really hard to, to figure out, you know, that's why I applied for your micro grant. So, so this is where, <laughs> just to cut to the chase, this is where I, I think I wanted to start for us to arrive there. <laughs> I was strategically right. asking these questions. Um, that um, I think there's a possibility there. I like what you're doing. And, and I think if there are grants, for example, because we have a 501, right? And my whole point of creating this place was to exactly find people like you and me who are uh, either, either you're limited, for example, in your case, being a postdoc, um, right. I am, you know, from, from our end, I am like, hey, you have an idea, you totally write it, you service PI, you know, if the idea is good, and we can submit these grants um, to, to anywhere, really. Um, of course, the big NIH ones, I think we're not kind of qualified yet because we're still not mature enough. Um, yeah. you know? But I think there are a lot of foundations out there that I don't know if you know about, the Austin Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, yeah. um, the, the Simons uh, Foundation, which, which fund those kind of things, right? Yeah, all kinds um, of education stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. So totally. you're saying, would you want to partner with Glocky Polymath yeah. to write like a Simons Foundation grant? Yeah, so it's something like if you find a place where you want to write something and you kind of want that freedom, you know, I think we could totally partner and, and you yes. could write that, right? Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will um, start working on that today. <laughs> in a way that, and then I think, so the, the win-win in a way is that, yeah, so the grant, for example, you can write it under us, um, 501c3, and, and, and I think you can develop in the proposal, right? You write exactly what it is that you want to do. Now it fits I can it. write grants. I will. <laughs> I will start on this today. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> uh, because we, that's the thing where I've distributed it, right? I, I'm not. We're not top end heavy. I'm structuring this somewhat like a department where there are essentially PIs, right? That can write his own grants too, in a way, right, Pete? And yeah. So, <laughs> and so, and so, like I've written grants under the the five hundred one that we and we've gotten some grants like that. We have a couple in right now. We're waiting on, right? And so it ends up being this community and everything comes in and uh, of course grants tend to be restricted. Um, and then you can, and I can send you the details because we're, we're literally coming up with these details as we go along. Like we're making stuff up as we go along. Okay? <laughs> yeah, I know all about that. <laughs> like I'm, list, I'm going, looking at the academic model, I'm like, okay, that doesn't make sense. I want to change this part so that we can do this. Yeah. Uh, we have one of the uh, team members who, just uh, hosted a conference, right? And for her, her stream was like, yep, people paid money to go to that conference right. and the funding, like she was able to put it under 501. It was just, anyway, it made sense, right? Um, so for my end, I, I think I will be, um, I'm, I'm open for you to absolutely think about using our 501 and, and try, at least try, hey, at least try, right? And, and for the thing that you wanna do, you said, I mean, because our funding is kind of small right now, uh, for the job biz, for example, you said the developer was you in this case, or was it someone else? Um, for which? When you wrote in the email, you said uh, I would use the funding like the job biz. Oh, yeah, to, to pay Tyler. No, oh. I, I haven't. Okay, it was Tyler. Yeah, I, I want to support the people who are not, who, whose passion project this is not. Okay. So, 
<laughs> um, yeah, um, Tyler is a web developer, a friend of mine okay. um, from Nebraska. And okay. He's, okay. He's is he in, in education or just he's, he's a pure web developer? Um, um, he, I, yeah. I mean, so he, he's a developer currently, but um, okay. I think he's trying to figure out what his long term. I mean, he's like doing a master's in climatology of all things. So, okay. So, okay. Um, yeah. So, um, so let me, so that I'll definitely, let's keep talking about this because I'm, I'm definitely want to explore like how that would work. Uh, Cause I think you at a juncture where you're trying to figure out which way to go. And a lot of organizations that we talk to actually through these essay and other chats, at that juncture, they're trying to figure out, so what, how do I do this? Right. Moving forward. Right. And, and sometimes everybody wants, not everybody, but it, it makes a difference, right? Do you want to spend all the time thinking through how do I develop a whole nonprofit, a whole new nonprofit, right? Yeah. And I can tell you I did that and it was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, so <laughs> my, uh, my main plan right now, yeah. to like really get this thing started, okay, is okay. working on a scientific paper about um, Barn Swallow Female Song, which is, you know, kind of something I described during my PhD, but like it's, it's weird. It's not known. Um, and it's really widely studied study system. So I think this has a potential to be, um, to catch the interest of the popular press and to like, you know, but it's an opportunity for me to model exactly what I'm talking about. So like mm -hmm. with this paper, if I could build the coolest, most badass like educational experience with that and then explore like, how you know can will the journal host educational materials as a supplementary material can you incorporate a link to that in your press release that kind of thing like i think that would be really cool uh, you know uh example of of exactly the type of educational connections and and bridging that gap between current knowledge and this largest audience that's not currently okay there. okay yeah so for the Proposal thing. Let's let's keep connect connecting on email to figure out um, what like if you were to write something, what would it be and what are possible avenues? There are quite a few uh, yeah. uh, foundations out there. Mm -hmm. uh, like what is a low hanging fruit, for example, right? That you can that you can tag right. on, right? Because I think there are quite a few of those. And yeah, you know, like, even your own like local a few grand here versus like a hundred thousand or something. Yeah, exactly. And I have sort of done step one step at a time. Like, okay, five there. Okay, cool. Even two there. Right. Two yeah. There. Well. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That still works, right? Just start slow, and then <laughs> suddenly you agree that traction and 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 history, history. But then you continue to to build on um, on that. Do you have any other questions for us? Um, this I feel is the first discussion and conversation, so um, we'll continue it for sure. But I'm just curious if you have any other uh questions uh, for us so you're in boston right yeah i'm in boston and pete or you're i'm in oh, uh, kalamazoo michigan michigan right okay cool. yeah so how many people are in boston so there are who three to five people in boston so we are kind of all over the place um mm -hmm. because we tried the beauty about this is you don't need a physical place to do this you can right. just totally be virtual and people are working on very diverse uh projects and I encourage you to check out our um, our kind of team webpage on um, on stemadvocacy.org. Um, so we have program leaders. The way we're structured, we have program leaders who are running these very independent projects, and they have mm -hmm. their own micro teams. Kind of think of them like having labs, and right. they're building their own mini labs. They can write grants and so forth. And then we have associates that are helping in different projects, and everyone's a volunteer. Okay. No one's paid or anything like that. <laughs> we just actually just got our first financial like administrator who I'm talking to soon uh, to help with like just the whole enterprise because it's yeah. coming to a point where I can't like do, you know, we can't, we need someone who, who's dedicated to just managing that side of it, right? Yeah, so what's what's your full-time position? So I work at Harvard in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. Right. I oversee the PhD program here. Cool. Uh, and so I, I tend to dance on both sides um, in the sense I think about these issues in one perspective when I'm at Harvard and then I swap roles and I think of it from a different side completely when I think about it from a grander, like meta level. Right. Right? Yeah. And that's what keeps me going. That's what for us, I you know, just try to find people a place where we can have this dialogue and even conversations like this, like literally, right? Yeah. Um, 
you know, I'm envisioning a, like a full on seminar series or where this can take place and we can really dig deep, right? And ask really yeah. interesting questions, just like in a research talk. Um, I don't see the difference actually, you know, just different topic. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and so, so that's where the location right now, it's kind of diverse, but a lot of the people are in the Northeast um, um, and we're still virtual mostly, so. Well, that's amazing. I, yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity to chat and yeah. collaborate going forward. I think this is really exciting. Yeah, yeah. So we'll keep chatting. I'm, I'm, I see this grant side. Sounds like you're very interested in that side, uh, and and so yeah. <laughs> uh, we are too. <laughs> yes. And so um, we, yeah, I've I've kind of struggled with like, yeah, for my you know how to pursue this entire monetization thing because like you, yes. you know you need money to pay people to like do something right absolutely um, absolutely but, you know um, the corporatization of education is one of the main problems and inequities in the country you know leading to all the wealth gap and a lot of the other things right i think the focus i think the more focused it is right um you want to pitch a very focused that we're going to do x like x is the problem and we're going to do this thing and we're right. going to do this thing right and 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 that will be it i just sent you a link to silinker.com on the chat thing i don't know if you saw that that's uh, another project that whom we are collaborating with uh, at Brandeis University. Mm -hmm. And there they got an NSF grant. The, um, I forgot which, which one, but there's, there's an NSF grant that is running that uh, proposal. So the, the NSF has a lot of opportunities too um, that has that possibility there. Um, so, so guys, I hate to end it there, but we're going to keep chatting. Um, Matt and Pete, thank you so much Great on that. Awesome. Thanks, okay. Matt. Yeah. Great to Thanks. meet both of you. Likewise. I can help you out in any way. Let me know. Awesome. Will do. Thanks. All right. Take awesome. care. All right. Bye. Bye.